All right, Vance, let me know since you've got the fastest yeah, live oh, live on YouTube. Well, it looks like we are live, live, even though on mine it still says it's loading. That's hilarious. Well, I better make uh, a better make. There you go. Now we are live. Well, we are live. Welcome, everybody, to AB Live. Welcome to the desert of the real, that ship smoke on the horizon. It is our Halloween special, too, on Halloween night. And happy Halloween to everybody. We will have a, a great show where we will spend a lot of great topics, including Clive Barker, Clive Barker, Charles Barkley, no, Clive Barker, <laughs> demonology, Fortean spirituality, and a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, hopefully we can make some magic happen and our suffering will be legendary even in hell. Absolutely. So, absolutely. And yes, uh, Thanks, everybody, for showing up. As I always like to say, please write your own gospel, live your own myth. You are the final authority, have always been. Uh, it is the hope of this show to kill all your heroes, all your saviors, and you can be in a place where you either inspire others or you are inspired by others. You are the final authority. And that's what I have to say about that. Um, before we uh, introduce our guests, and we'll take a little bit of time as people go into the chat room, uh, I wanted to say, please support Aeon Byte. I have, um, the success of the show has really been word by word, by word of mouth. I have had several uh, tech experts, high level tech experts. I've had some agencies look at my online presence and there is no doubt this show gets shadow banned big time. And uh, it uh, should be, well, the show does very well, but again, it's word by mouth and it should have a lot higher reach when it comes to organic uh, reach and organic traffic. But that is, the, that is the world we live in today. Those who speak the truth in these times of universal deceit, uh, well, they do revolutionary acts and uh, revolutionary acts and words are looked down upon and frowned and censored in this world. So please support Aeon Byte at the very least by telling others about this blasphemy. And of course, it always helps to uh, subscribe and uh, support in any way you can. Truly appreciate those of you who continually help grow this Red Bill cafeteria. Other than that, uh, as you know, uh, the rules are the rules or whatever you want to call it are the same. If you have any questions, please type them in in the chat, put some question marks, caps and all that, and we will get to them. If you want to support with some super chats, you will be put on top of the queue as long as not something, uh, well, too weird or irrelevant. Uh, you guys know the rules, people who go in the chat, and it's always a good time. But anyway, uh, yes, it's Halloween night. And with us, we've got a very exciting list. First, I'd like to welcome back Anthony Tyler. Anthony, thanks for coming on Aeon Byte to this AB Live. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be back and good to see you. Uh, happy Halloween to everybody listening. Great to have you and thanks for everything. I uh, look forward to our chat. And with mm -hmm. us, and tonight we have the occult fan, Nate Miller. Nate, how are you doing? And tell us about your guest. Uh, this is Hank. And uh, Hank is a skull and uh, it's made of resin and has a golden coin that. I got through uh, some complete accident. Some uh, Dunkin' Donuts lady gave me the wrong sandwich. I refused a sandwich. My change returned had this gold coin in it. So it's kind of like totally accidental. So uh, if that's the guess, that's also my better half, uh, Rhonda Blanc, the white queen. JJ. Hey, Rhonda. Good to see you. Happy Halloween, good. everyone. Thanks for having us, Miguel. Hi, Vance. And uh, hey, everyone. Hey, so, hey. Good to see you. Awesome. Awesome. And as Nate just mentioned, we've got the Moondonk Vance. How are you doing, Vance? Oh, pretty good. Recovering from The Exorcist, which I just watched before uh, 10 minutes before this started. And looking forward to a spooky evening. And you say that it's been a while since you've watched the movie. What do you think? I think it still holds up. 
oh, the yeah. test of it's time. Amazing. It looks like it could have been filmed today. Absolutely. You know, I saw it when it first came out, believe it or not. I went to New York to see it. I waited in line for Lowe's Theater. So, and it was a long line. It wasn't the first night, but that's what I did. And I was very young, of course. So, it was it was good. And uh, the power of Christ compels you. Uh, I didn't realize they said it about 50 times. I, I thought they said it a couple of times. That was it. But no, 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 no. And it was uh, Max von Sido, Sido, and he he looked old back then, and he passed oh, yeah. away just recently. It's like he never aged. Makeup. It was Abe Vigoda's cousin. Um, was the uh, oh. wasn't that uh, during some kind of test screenings of that film? There was this whole MK Ultra, like um, I don't know, like what program it was specifically, but they were pulsing like super fear waves into the audience. Do you guys know anything about that? No, as I, I was, we were talking before the show, William T. Blatty, who wrote it, was an ex-Jesuit. He was in military intelligence. So you see a lot of this uh, high weirdness in the movie, The Exorcist, and uh, some of his other works and even novels. So check out uh, William T. Blatty for more. But yeah, that movie, some have said... It's the movie is not about an exorcism. It's about an MK Ultra, a child experiment to break down the child and make the child into what they do: break down into make the child into a monster, into whatever you want. So it's a, wow. a hidden yeah. message. That so, um, I heard there was a run on pea soup uh, after the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my yes. wife's favorite part. You know the pea soup projection. <laughs> Could I, I just? The uh, the subliminal message isn't quite clear. Um, there's this amazing Scottish band everyone should check out called Mogwai. Uh, they just uh, have announced a new album that comes out in February. Long story short, is their second album has I hope I'm not like second album trick or treat. Uh, their second album has the face that flashes throughout The Exorcist, which makes it especially terrifying. This thing's known as it's a cult. It's a it's a cultural phenomenon known as Captain Howdy. Oh yeah. Second. Yeah yeah yeah. Cool. I saw it once. The face I saw once. It must have been uh, more, but I did get to see it once. Air Bears in Wonderland totally does that, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> A classic of many classics. Well, tonight we also want to talk about another, uh, well, somebody who has created many classics, and that is Clive Barker. I feel he is one of the really underrated uh, giants of fantasy, dark fantasy, and horror. Of course, I don't think Clive, he's going to live very well in LA. He's been very successful at what he's done, but I still think he's under, I don't think he's ever hit the levels of uh, uh, Stephen King or Dean Koontz or J.K. Rowling's or others when I feel he is far more talented than all of them, probably put together as a creator and a writer. And uh, he definitely brings a lot of awesome occult uh, innovations to the table. He's very much uh, almost like Neil Gaiman. He really brings that mm -hmm. uh, dark fantasy and the magical realism and mythologies to life and applies them to for a modern audience and uh, very underrated. I, one of my favorite novels of all time is his novel Imagica. It's uh, 800 words and it's such a wonderful adventure very intense uh, like Clive Barker very gory but also full of elegance and beauty and high fantasy at the same time <clears throat> excuse me at the same time and I've even watched one of his plays the what is the name of the place so the history of the devil which is a uh, his play about Satan falling and he puts his old his own slant into it so I feel mm -hmm. Clive Barker is a very underrated uh individual who should definitely get uh, some more love but so i'll just uh talk to you anthony tell us about your thoughts on clive barker what he brings to the table and let me know if you want to talk about some of his movies or works or whatever you want to talk man cool okay well yeah there's so there's so many different parts that uh that angles that we could start from but i think um most importantly you know the 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 essential premise um you know, just certainly he's got a lot of different work out there, but uh, I I like to think I think a lot of people see the first two Hellraiser movies as some of his most quintessential work because the 
part of the beauty of it is he wrote and directed and produced it. And it was did that it, it 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 really is Clive Barker to the core, and uh, he's such a he's such a whiz with practical effects as well. Um, all the, the the whole practical effect angle is uh, obviously an art in and of itself. But um, so you know, regarding the uh, the just the whole concept of the Cenobite and um, and what you find, especially in the first two Hellraisers. Um, it, you know, it's interesting, and I guess this is a recurring theme throughout the Hellraisers. This is like a quintessential motif: um, the the apex, uh, this this transcendence of uh, of pain and pleasure uh, to horrifying extents. Um, it's uh, it's similar. You know, uh, the last time I was on, we talked about, um, and I'm sure we'll get into uh, in varying degrees again the. Uh, the, the shadow complex and union psychology and and Faust and um the, you know Faust being one of the the oldest uh, uh, legends of a demon and um um it's so it, yeah it's interesting to note I guess uh, uh first of all that when um well to in order to really suss out demonology and something like a a, a Cenobite um from like a an archetypal symbolic perspective you have to consider what evil even is to begin with, uh, because it, it's even um, slightly ambiguous, um, at least in a shade in the, in the Hellraisers. You know, the, the the in the second one specifically, there's a scene that I very much like, and it's all super 80s, but it's they're classics, they're great. Um, where um, uh, Kirsty, the protagonist, is stuck in the dimensions of the Cenobite and um, um, looking Pinhead right in the face, and is pretty much going to be set up to the torture rack and everything. But but somehow she's able to recognize this this shade of um, of humanity in the in the Cenobite and um, and in them all, and and you see, you see them slowly start to remember that they were once these beings, these humans, and were uh, through their journeys uh, pushed to the extents in in um, in a very like in a way that harkens back to Lovecraft in some sense. But uh, Barker's so unique because it's existential horror. You know, we're dealing with like dimensions and all these things, but it, there's such a personal element to it. Um, Lovecraft was so impersonal. That was his whole motif was the impersonality of horror. But uh, but Barker brings it down. Um, um, he, uh, he, he makes it personal. There's a whole ritualized element to it. And, um, and you know, it, the, uh, it, it's, it's the whole, one of the ways, uh, that, that, that you can look at it is, um, it, especially with, uh, with, with Barker's Hellraiser that following your bliss, not always, uh, the best thing sometimes, because that's how it starts. You, the, these people are, are looking for the utmost, um, to, to transcend the limitations of the human experience. And they don't, they don't quite realize how, how uh, specifically horrifying it is. Um, and, you know, in the, in the, uh, on the opposite side of that coin, the, the whole, um, the spin that Gautier puts on the rendition, his rendition of Faust uh, being that while Mephistopheles is certainly um, a demon for all intents and purposes as personified to Faust, um, at the beginning of the play, anyone familiar with it will know that uh, Mephistopheles is, is an angel in the, in the court of heaven. And there's this uh, there's this dialogue between Mephistopheles and God that uh, is very directly reminiscent of uh, the book of Job and the bet that kind of goes on. And in many ways, the story of Faust is kind of like an inversion of the book of Job. Um, but, but so we see that um, not only should you not follow your bliss sometimes, but that you know, you learn through your blisters in other times, in the case that Faust, uh, Faust and his dealings with Mephistopheles. And while there is very direct evil, um, and, you know, we, I, I'm prepared, we could get into cases of possession and different things like that. Um, but, uh, and, and I think there is overt evil out there um, in what you could say is a metaphysical sense. But in so many cases, um, in the, illustrated by the, the things I just went into, um, it's not always as straightforward uh, as one would like to think. And there are some gray areas. Um, not everything is purely uh, good or evil, uh, or very few things. You know, you could argue that in like the Neoplatonic sense of the ideals, if everything has some sort of ideal presence, um, 
some utmost core um, like ontological presence, then certainly good and evil do have that presence. So I don't know. There's a, there's some good food for thought initially. I don't know what you guys would like to add to that. Yeah, I think it's great the idea of tying it to uh, to Githa's Faustus. I mean, that really is a, probably the first novel or story. Usually in ancient times, you you summon gods and spirits to help you out and the tribe out. It wasn't just com- nobody really summoned gods for material pleasure. It was just or. Uh, Right. So uh, this really takes it to a very individual level where the person is talking to this higher being for his own good. It's sort of, I guess, the new age secret before it was cool. <laughs> and, then, and Hellraiser does it too. And I, I should mention mm-hmm. uh, Barker, Clive Barker, obviously, when you look at who influenced him, you've got a who's who of uh, Gnostic luminaries. He was very influenced mm-hmm. by Herman Melville uh William Burroughs, William Blake. So and then he was obviously as most horror writers he was influenced by Edgar Allan Poe. Uh he Ray Bradbury was big and Ray Bradbury has does have some horrors but uh, it is true uh, yeah Pinhead and the uh, the Cenobites are not really evil. They're uh, I think in the story they're they're actually a, a, a priestly order from hell who is trying to join pleasure and pain. And the word Cenobite comes from the Latin for this, uh, it was this uh, medieval order of monks who was very disattached from society. And in a way, Pinhead is really a very much an orthodox fundamentalist priest. I mean, the the themes are there, you know, uh, what do we find in Catholicism? Pleasure is bad, but suffering is good. And these two get joined in with the flagellation and the the praying and the suffer they get mixed in and the Cenobites are simply sort of a, a supernatural version of that. And I guess uh, Pinhead sort of finds redemption and on the second movie, as you said, simply by finding his humanity. And uh, also too, Pinhead, he um, really changed the way horror was in the eighties. Horror villains were just idiots, whether it was Jason or Mike Myers or Freddy Krueger he brought a more elegance and intelligence to the horror villain, which paved the way for such movies as Event Horizon or Scream. More, it was more horror got a lot more intellectual in the '90s, if you would. So, mm-hmm. um, but uh, yeah, what else do you think about this, Anthony? Um, well, you know, from here, um, I, uh, you know, it. it, it it's, it, I think it's important to penetrate a little bit further into the nature of the shadow itself, I would say. And I would also like to add, um, you know, elaborating on that, uh, the, that I really feel like um, the best example of something like, um, other than the very direct references that you just talked about with the order and whatnot, when we're talking about Cenobites and what they represent on this, um, uh, like uh, the symbolic existential level. Um, it seems that to me, um, I, I don't think I'd be the only one to think this, uh, Lilith, the, uh, the ancient, uh, demoness slash, uh, queen of hell, queen of the tree of life really seems to be, uh, one of, if not the most classical, uh, real life depiction of what you could call a Cenobite. And, um, and, in many different ways, uh, but specifically the fact that, uh, this this archetype in and of itself um, has uh, a sort of cathartic quality to it because Lilith, for anyone who does not know, um, is really uh, it, it stems ultimately from uh, the 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 sleep paralysis symptoms that people have experienced throughout thousands of years. It's very curious to note that sleep paralysis has been this quintessential crux of demonology. Um, and it's carried forth even to this day. And that's where you get the, the, the classical depictions of the succubus and the incubus, um, these being male and female vampires. And um, it, uh, it really is uh, just the utmost, it's the epitome um, of examples for this, uh, like the vampire being this, uh, especially today, this classical amalgamation of uh, something that is beautiful and horrifying at the same time. Uh, and something that uh, Barker likes to do with this uh, 
this uh, blurring the lines between not only pain and pleasure, but uh, it, it, taking it to um, sexual extents, not in gory ways or anything. Like it, uh, Barker's eloquent; he's very, he's very elegant about it. But it's uh, he takes um, it's it's certainly um, it's certainly reminiscent of what Lilith is, um, and I think that. Um, in, in many ways, the tree of death is, uh, is one of the biggest survivals of demonology as we know it. Um, but you know, it, in general, when, when considering the history of demonology, um, to, to, to take a broader scope than just Barker for a moment, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important to understand that, there is some sort of, uh, there's a crossroads between what you could call disease and illness. Disease being these, uh, the variety of physical symptoms and illness more so being a person's psychological standpoint and reaction to the given disease. And, um, you know, possessions uh, today, uh, they're, they're reported to be on the rise in the U.S. and have been for some time. And that's that's very strange because we like to think that we're in a very postmodern skeptical society. Um, and you, people would like to think that priests are um, – and don't get me wrong. There's plenty of corruption with the Catholic Church in these things. But when you're considering um, the, uh, the the – the historical implications and uh, the, the the tradition of exorcisms that have survived, uh, people uh, priests would not be operating on any sort of uh, with any platform of exorcisms actually taking place if they did not take it very seriously because they could be shut down for human rights violations and all sorts of things. I mean, there have been these kinds of debates before. This is nothing new, um, as we know with the case of Annalise Michelle which was the inspiration for the horror movie, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Um, so a great example where the priests were actually charged with manslaughter at the end of it. But, but with, the, with the case of um, Annalise Michelle, um, while it was not handled effectively in the long run, there were some very strange anomalous symptoms. And it seems to be that at this crossroads of disease and illness, um, like I said, anomalous things start to occur. Uh, they, you could go online and find uh, recordings of her uh, exorcism tapes, and they are, oh my word, it is, it is jarring, um, to say the least. Talk about um, a Halloween soundtrack, good Lord. So, so there's strange things that happen, and the same thing with uh, like sleep paralysis events. You know, we can look at this, the brain science behind it now and understand that there's a literal... Um, sensory body projection process happening where um, on a, on a, on a, on a level of brain science, we're basically projecting our own body map um, in some sort of more autonomous way since we've gone deeper into the sleep process. And now it's creating a, so we could see this kind of puppeteering effect. that's almost similar to a phantom limb effect, but it it, it, it begins to take on all these anomalous properties. So you, get, you get all these paranormal things. The, the temperature dropping is often associated with the shadow people. And you see different forms of shadow people. You know, there, people talk about the man with the fedora hat. And um, they sometimes see animals and hellhounds. Um, and there's, uh, I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's plenty of case to be made that uh, there is, you know, um, a gray area uh, in what people like to think of as alien abduction and sleep paralysis events as well. So um, yeah, uh, it, demonology today, the, it, the more you look into the phenomenology, the more you see that um, it rides on the heels of disease and, uh, and human suffering in a very literal way that uh, it was when you look into possession cases, it's rarely, I'm not going to say it never happens, but rarely is it a just a perfectly normal functioning person that just flies off the deep end. There's all sorts of uh, a, a compounding, a comp, bleh, excuse me, a compounding variety of diseases. Like uh, throughout history, not only was sleep paralysis associated with demonology, but obviously so was epilepsy. And, and uh, of course, I'm not saying that people with epilepsy are possessed with demons, but it's 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 uh, unavoidable to note that even in today's society, 
in like in the case of Annalise Michelle, where there were a certain amount of control methods put in place and she was taken to doctors and neurologists and was ex- was still experiencing very strange anomalous uh, symptoms and activities. Um, so, um, I don't know, there's, uh, there's, you know, some food for thought there, but, um, um, demonology in and of itself, uh, is, is, uh, something that, like I said, it's a, it's a compounding thing and, uh, we could go further from there, but, you know, I know we got some other people in the chat, so. On yeah, a- well, uh, yeah, no, it's really well said. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here and it's, yeah, because we're talking about the shadow and complex as we're going Jungian, but obviously there is supernatural, but then that's not wrong because as you probably know, and we all know here when, when Jung had his uh, red book, Abraxas thing, there was all this supernatural stuff happening in his house. I mean, mm-hmm. there are families saying Jung is going inside his soul, but there's ghosts and objects moving and his family's just shitting themselves so mm-hmm. that, yeah, I'm, I'm, i try to think that nexus between the supernatural and the inner world and what is there really a difference and i get confused and and good point about the exorcism we were talking about the exorcist i forgot but if and i forgot what scene it is we might have to look it up on youtube but there is evidence in, I think, the book and the movie that Linda Blair is being sexually assaulted before she gets possessed by Pazuzu. There's like one scene that's so obvious she's being, it's like it, and you, most people miss it, but because mm-hmm. again, in the movie, she seems to have a great life. I think, you know, the wife is separated from the from the dad, but other than that, but yeah, she's being sexually assaulted which allows the demon to take over. So the butler did it. <laughs> the butler did the it. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's the same thing in Twin Peaks, of course. Uh, I mean, sorry if that's a spoiler to too many people, but yeah. Oh. Just say the butler oh, yeah. did it. <laughs> so, uh, well, we'll get some <laughs> questions, but uh, what do you think, Nate? About uh, Oh, first, I also wanted to say also true about Lilith. One thing that fascinates me is Jewish demonology and magic because it is really, really intense. I mean, most people don't know, but in Greco-Roman times, if you needed some high hardcore magic or uh, exorcism, you didn't go to the temple of uh, Hecate or Isis. You went to the the Jew or the Galilean or somebody who spoke Aramaic and they would bring this high powered magic of course they probably inherited from the babylonians and so forth but uh and then of course you get into medieval jewish magic and it is it is intense very powerful stuff so um something i'm really fascinated with and uh i think it's overlooked a lot uh through uh, by occultists i mean yeah of course the 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 golden dawn cabal and all that which i feel is kind of uh it's kind of wussy stuff for magicians, but yeah, I like the okay. hardcore black magic stuff. Cause I, <laughs> as you said, that's where the shadow stuff, that's what you get into the real, I got to face myself and my demons, <laughs> but Absolutely. Nate, uh, what do you think? Man, um, I'll keep mine as quick as I can. I, I definitely think white lodge is a quick way to say like, you know, on this night, you know, where all of the, uh, the veils are thin, um, you know, you gotta you gotta walk through the middle path is what I would advise as if mm-hmm. I know as if I as if I know anything at all, which do not as that's the first mistake you'll make is listening to me. But the second mistake you'll make is not listening to me. So just <laughs> middle path, but also like I think there's something to be said for like maybe Gigi Young would talk about like fifth dimensional stuff. So there's like what how many different ways we can look at this, like from the classical vampiric way of looking at things through folk tales which often are neglected too. I think like that there's some parts of the the conservative past that we want to maintain to retrieve our humanity. If you understand what I mean, speaking of monsters, there's a way to become a monster without having a mooring to who we are. I didn't mean to go there, but there it is. Uh, I guess like one of the other things is, is like, you know, you can consider this night uh, an extenuation, an extension of like, because like what's a bipolar allegedly, but a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde or a werewolf or a lunatic, right? So all of these other kind of pathologies we can include as made extreme, you know, same thing with an alien abduction or something like that. But um, I don't know. I didn't mean to go all the, the way over there, but I do think people need to try to align with the White Lodge. And to do that, you actually have to fight your own self. 
You're either an upward spiraler. You're, I'll finish with this. You're either an, this is just whatever, right? Like I said, don't listen. You're either an upward spiraler who's forgiving people and just letting yourself get lighter in that and keeping on doing your work, or you're someone who's just going to be um, eventually uh, recycled. There. That, that's not what I was going to say, quite frankly. But um, there you go. Happy Halloween. Uh, right on. Happy Halloween and happy Halloween to those who are joining the chat. We got a gr good group already, and I'm sure we must have some questions. Vance, or do you have anything to say, or do we have any questions from our esteemed guests or people at the chat at the virtual Alexandria? Well, I've got one question, and um, uh, my audio is okay, right? I have to switch channels here. Yeah, okay. yeah. Looks, sounds um, good. I agree with Nate. You know, um, quite a while ago, uh, one of the things that I received directly, so to speak, is that you're either going toward the God above God, you know, the, the, the great unity, the monad, or you're going away. There's only two. That's the only real choice we have. That, that's what I was told. And everything else is a variation on that. And um, the other thing I say, I um, want to say it quickly before I get to the question, uh, is um, I've noticed recently that, you know, uh, tonight's Halloween, right? So we're talking about the spooks and the vampires and the evil things and the demons and so forth, the exorcist, the Halloween, the pure evil, Mike Myers, so forth. Uh, but uh, when you go back to the Greeks, they saw things a lot differently, didn't they? they? They weren't into this totally good and evil thing. It was like just, it's almost like the way, you know, we Gnostics uh, oftentimes like to think where we're, we're just kind of in the middle and we're watching it all and we're looking at the reasons people do things, you know, and all the troubles Zeus had with the Titans and so forth. And, and so there seems to be uh, throughout history, we developed this polarity of the, the evil and the good and the religions of mankind reflect that, at least in the Western world. So that's kind of an observation I have to make. So, but tonight, I guess, is the more on the polarity side, the vampires. And, and I, you know, I like that, uh, the confluence between the incubus and the succubus and the vampires never occurred to me. I just saw Dracula not too many nights ago, so, which is great. So, and now to the question, uh, Oswald Spengler wants to know of the group here, if you guys think there'll be any more sequels to Halloween, or maybe he meant any more great Halloween movies in general. I don't mm. know. I, I, I should mention that uh, they are doing the reboot of Hellraiser in 2021. And just an article came out yesterday, October 30th, that Clive Barker is going to join as a consultant and write, help write with the screenplay. So, uh, this could be some uh, good modern mythology. Um, so that's at least I know good news. But yeah, I don't, I don't can't remember the last time I watched a, a horror movie. I mean, my favorite one might be Showgirls, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but quite uh, a horror movie. <laughs> I heard they're going to make one based on the presidential election. That's oh my god, that is yeah, that's a horror right there. My god, something out Agreed. of um, yeah, and. Uh, one thing I also wanted to mention, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the film Nightbreed. Um, and that's another uh, Clive Barker. He also directed and wrote it, low budget. Uh, I think it should, it's a pity because it's, a, again, a great concept about this city underground uh, graveyard where monsters live, but they're all the monsters of our fantasies, elves and vampires, and they all live in harmony under this place because they're hiding from the true monster human beings mm -hmm. and how they're trying to cope and they've been vilified through stories and all that and uh I, my point is that clive barker he's ahead of the game because uh the the creepy villain is the psychiatrist psychiatrist in this movie and this guy is doing classic MK Ultra stuff to his patients to manipulate him to do horrible stuff. He's giving them LSD, hypnotism. So Barker in the 80s is sort of giving these hints <clears throat> about, again, what our government is doing. And of all people playing the psychiatrist is David Cronenberg. It still makes me laugh that oh. he's in a movie and he's wow. sort of this creepy psychiatrist who's eventually going to try and destroy the monsters because that's what... 
MK Ultra does, right? Destroy human fantasy, human imagination. But uh, I think, uh, uh, anyway, there's a lot of his movies where really are very prescient or give insight into stuff long before the whole conspiracy theory culture grabbed on to these issues. Barker was already sort of hinting them and, and whatever. Um, but my question for you, Anthony, uh, you talk about trans physical phenomena in your book, uh, Dive Manual. Uh, I, I keep wanting to call it Diver Down because Eddie Van Halen died recently. <laughs> but no, <laughs> Dive Manual, uh, Empirical Investigations into Mysticism. Good book uh, for the audience. Definitely check it out in our first interview. But tell the audience about trans physical phenomena and how this relates to all that we're talking about. Okay, absolutely. Um, so Transphysical phenomena um, is the the best description, the best term I could come up with for this uh, this uh, sliding scale of reality. Because certainly there's a line between objective and subjective. But again, um, similar with metaphysics, as we just talked about, there is some sort of gray area and a bit of malleability here. Um, so. Uh, and you can see that this really, really gets into uh, Fortia and another unexplainable slash paranormal type phenomena really quickly. But um, it still uh, toes the line of uh, esotericism and metaphysics uh, as well, because this even brings us into um, or uh, keeps us along the same lines of uh, possession and exorcisms. Uh, because, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting. Um, since we've already talked about uh, possessions a little bit, I'll elaborate on this first um, in terms of the transphysical phenomena. You hear all these stories throughout the years, and let's say, sure, that some of this is embellishment, uh, undoubtedly, Like, um, but it's the same thing with any other unexplainable phenomena, UFOs or ghosts. If even one of the stories is true, um, then that changes the entire ballgame, and there's there's so many, there's a countless amount of all of them. So, you know, the chances of at least one having some legitimacy is, uh, I don't know, um, I'm not that skeptical. Uh, I think that's a, that's a bit blind, uh, to be honest. But um, so that in mind, that little disclaimer aside, uh, you hear all sorts of different stories that, that are still modern. Um, um, you know, things of uh, the classical possession signs where they're speaking languages like Aramaic and um, uh, other ancient languages that they would have never understood. Um, and, you know, there are people to this day uh, practicing um, exorcists that talk about seeing levitation. Um, there's the the uh, the sort of telepathy, in a sense, of, uh, the, of the possessed knowing the innermost guilt of, uh, of the people around them. And, uh, and you also, there's a famous story, um, which is in one of those possession movies, that possession movie with Anthony Hopkins, which was also a book. I think it was called the right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, there's the anecdote, there's the story of, uh, the possessed, uh, um, vomiting crucifixion nails. And there's other stories of, uh, the possessed vomiting out other inanimate objects or like artifacts in some ways. And usually like these are never, they're, they're never able to be maintained or uh, contained rather. Um, when you actually dig into the accounts, you see that everyone experiences these things. They see them. There's like, there's, uh, there's proportionate physical interaction to it. Um, if that makes sense, but, but when they try to contain it, these things like disappear or disintegrate and there's no trace of it. So, and this reminds me of, um, uh, in many ways, uh, the, the surroundings of, um, larger scale events like the, the Mothman and UFO and men in black sightings in Point Pleasant, West Virginia throughout the Mothman prophecies, as well as the classical, accounts, the mind-blowing accounts of Fatima, um, for anyone who knows about those. Uh, and Jung talked about this in his book about flying saucers, as well as other places. And this is very reminiscent of uh, this sort of John Keel, Jacques Vallée perspective as well, where when there's a certain amount of psychological inertia, especially when numbers are involved, there becomes this sort of cascade priming effect in the psyche where we all get on the same page and um, hypnotic triggers start to progress. And, and it seems that um, 
because we know that in hysteria, people can see all sorts of things, all sorts of hallucinations and whatever else. So if in, and hysteria is generally considered a negative thing, whereas Fatima, for example, was a very positive thing, um, albeit pretty eerie. Um, but uh, so if, if that can happen with negative things, then certainly it could happen with, um, with, uh, with the more positive things. And, and it, I, I I think the evidence shows that this is what's happening during possessions um, is I don't, I'm not necessarily convinced that any of these things are actually literally physical, but people see these things all the time in these settings. And there's um, what I would call like a transference effect going on, which is how Jung describes the relationship between the therapist and the patient and how there's this, uh, this implicit unconscious uh, psychological trust but uh, that's almost um, familial, where where you know that um, where you're operating on the same page, and you can, uh, and and like I said, a certain amount of trust. And clearly, there is uh, that sort of relationship with um, a, a a priest who is engaging in exorcist rites and the person that is allegedly possessed. Um, so while it, it, because the a big critique about um, uh, possessions is that there's got to be some sort of implicit placebo effect like a person being willing to believe that they are possessed and that is 100 percent part of it but the really curious thing is that when there's inertia brought about through um, these sort of transfer these psychologically transferred agreements um, that, very unique things begin to happen. And again, this is found in um, uh, not only something like uh, exorcism, but uh, Fortean phenomena all over the place and can describe sleep paralysis symptoms as well. So, and phantom yeah. limb syndrome. Yeah. You know. Can I add something to that? Yeah, uh, please do. So when you, when, when I was a kid, I'm going to, I'm going to come full circle here. Please do. You know, even work on that one. Uh, so the idea is like when I was younger, I used to be um, past my sentence returns. Uh, I, I'm a Venus ruled guy. I'm born on the equinox. Literally, I'm born on the aut autumnal equinox. So I kind of like have this Venus freaking thing coming through me. Um, Clive Barker, I want to draw to everyone's attention, is born on um, as well as a Libra. I've got this chart up in front of me and everything in his third house of communication. He's got this beautiful Saturn with Neptune and all his weird dreamy stuff. It's super tight. His chart's like blisteringly him. But anyway, so he worked as a male prostitute. And my point, well, like when he couldn't make enough money doing his stuff here, I've got his I totally did research ahead of time. So what happens is, is that he actually you take on the other people that you join with is my point. So be conscientious as you move forward in your journey as some possible advice. There are agreements made by our bodies on etheric levels. Let me simplify my entire point into that simple, because I think that's an important thing to add while we're talking about possessions. Very real advice here. Hypothetically, I'm not your doctor, or maybe I am. The point is, is that you should look into what you're doing on your subtle layers with who you're with. And if you're and one of the reasons you keep people six feet apart is because that's the magnetic range of the heart. Anyways, enough about masks. Well said. Well said. Well said, indeed. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, Barker had to do certain things early in his career, but uh, he and he also had to, yeah, he had to suffer some really bad health issues that kind of uh, uh, boarded his career for a while. So yeah, he's he has to he's had to swim up uphill much of his life. Um, what do you think, Anthony, about the idea of egregores? I mean, I think egregores also kind of helps. Uh, this again, as we we're talking about supernatural, psychological, or psycho spiritual. Because, mm -hmm. for example, and I've told this story, I did some ghost hunting in Chicago for a while, and we go to places where Al Capone had his, you know, like, secret accountants. And these are places where people were definitely recorded to have been killed. And we go downstairs with all our little tools. And yes, you know, you suddenly we'd all be there. and the temperature would go down, we get our rods and there was something we'd see the orbs take pictures and we had these orbs that were just appearing out of nowhere. But we'd suddenly somebody would talk or ask to talk to their grandma, then the temperature would go down and that person would start asking very uh, important questions that only the grandma would know. So it, this was something that 
it was definitely supernatural. But I always thought, is this the grandma or are we all giving our psychic energy to this person and enough power for that person to really raise their levels to a higher level where they can get this information and uh, speak. So I, I always wonder, was it the grandma or are we creating an egregore of the grandma, which is just as powerful as the grandma? What do you think? Hmm. Um, it's, I think in some sense it has to be on a case by case basis because um, um, if I were to, um, you know, my best guess, I guess, to uh, the situation is I think that a lot of this stuff could be considered egregores, like these thought form entities that people collectively create. Um, right. But um, I, I can't help but think that there also are things that, um, that, that have uh, in the almost the Lovecraftian way, but not not exclusively in a bad way. Uh, that are primordial as well. Right. Um, the things that have followed us um, throughout essentially our entire evolutionary scale. Um, and however, quote unquote, sentient you want to argue those things are is a different story. But their presence is pretty inarguable at this rate. Um, but I do think that, um, and I think if anything. Egregores um, might explain uh, Fortean phenomena the best because um, to to bring this full circle a little bit, all these different things. The 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 reason that the human uh, that the human experience and our biology has even the capacity to have what you could call um, hallucinatory uh, effects out of trance states that that um, become therefore transphysical. Um, that um well um the, the um man <laughs> i don't remember what i was gonna say there oh man um oh that's okay yeah we were talking about egregores 14 uh well let oh me right yeah Sorry. Um, so we, uh, with the 14 phenomena, um, there's the, uh, the, you know, we're ultimately looking at the projection process, like I said. And, um, and this is stemming from when you look at the evolutionary scale, um, this is dealing with the same kind of uh, pressures and biological correlates as uh, dream phenomena. And what do we know about dreams um, or what we do know about dreams, I should say, is that it's it's um it's a, an accumulation of the sensory data that you have um that that you've gathered through your experience but it's not just simply random feedback um as some people would like to say and there's obviously a lot of syntax to the symbols found in dreams if you begin to interpret them and i really think and again i'm not the only one to uh, to feel this way this is a very valet and keeling and union perspective um that this uh this what I would call transphysical phenomena, um, therefore unexplainable Fortean things, have the same projection process similar to a dream, where these things have syntax to them. And uh, when you have Im impactful dreams, um, the psychologist and the esotericists alike will tell you that before and after uh, the events that you experience in waking life before and after a dream are just as important as the dream itself because it's all about context and syntax. And I think it's also, um, I think that that is a, a big takeaway when trying to understand unexplainable phenomena in general, is that it's the context and syntax that is very important. And, you know, if you see a UFO, um, you know, you might want to think about the, uh, the potential um, psychological esoteric implications that have surrounded the, the events that took place before and after. So, um yeah there's a uh, um there's something and what that syntax and context helps us understand is um if nothing else if nothing else because there's a lot of um just by the definition of it it's unexplainable we're not going to know at all but if nothing else it helps us understand um the inner mechanisms that compel us to uh project these things to begin with um, so, which is, which is everything. I mean, that's the alchemical process right there. Um, because, you know, certainly, as we said, there are these neoplatonic good and evil qualities. Um, but 
there's this uh, this sliding scale, and what that essentially is is the alchemical process. You know, that's what that's what the impurities of dark on the scale to light is. Is this sort of gauging process, this sort of organizational time, uh, 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 this scale, so that we can um, identify our relationship um, and the risk factors involved in our relationship to truth and understanding. Because it's this classical uh, Eastern notion, um, especially very Buddhist, uh, that when we begin to understand, when we find, when we begin to understand the uh, the the implications and the underlying cause uh, causality and, and and factors involved with what we could consider evil, um, when we begin to understand that, it often undermines the quality of the evil. Uh, because a lot of these things are error and misunderstanding to begin with. Um, so um, I think that that's a, that's a really important takeaway. Um, but uh, it, because, yeah, because it's a refinement process and um, you have to, it, these things like the, the whole, this whole shadow projection process shouldn't necessarily be glorified, but it should on some level be embraced the same way that Dante embraces uh, Virgil uh, in uh, the divine comedy. Um, um, so, and, you know, also uh, in the spirit of Halloween, um, I wanted to bring up um, a couple things. Uh, sure. First off, um, I've mentioned this elsewhere before, but I would be, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring it up um, it, on the topic of possessions and epilepsy. Um, so first of all, you can, of course, if you look into it, you can find that many great uh, scholars and artists throughout history um, have had epilepsy. Um, so, and it's, and it, especially of the temporal lobe kind, uh, where the, 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 by definition of the, um, of the type of epilepsy, you are having these like symbolic, highly existential, even philosophical uh, visions. And, and so that can, uh, that can really inspire people like, uh, like Dostoevsky and it was, um, Dante was as well said to have epilepsy and Michelangelo and all these other people. Um, uh, but also on the, uh, on the opposite end, when, like, you know, when we talked about, uh, mental illness and disease and this apex that, that leads into anomalous demonology, um, we find that it can definitely, um, lead people, especially with compounding factors into these very dark places where they do not know how to cope and they become fractured and compartmentalized and even animalistic in that way where of course they're still human, but different factors have overtaken, um, their humanity on massive levels. And you can see, um, epilepsy and especially temporal, uh, bleh, temporal lobe epilepsy found um, in, uh, in a lot of classical serial killers, like, um, Richard Ramirez, the night stalker being a very classical example. I mean, you don't get someone more into Satanism than Richard Ramirez. Um, and he was, he was clinically diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. So it's very, and, and he talked about how he had relationships with demons and Lucifer and these things. Um, and it's also interesting to note, although it wasn't, um, diagnosed as specifically as Ramirez. Um, like I, I never found, um, I found out what type of epilepsy it was, but, um, David Berkowitz, son of Sam, uh, also was reported to have epilepsy throughout his childhood. And that guy thought that, uh, the devil was talking to him through his dogs and his neighbor and all sorts of things and went on a killing spree and may or may not have been actually involved with, uh, legitimate, uh, like anarchistic satanic cults in New York. Um, which is a whole rabbit hole from there. And you also got Gacy, who was reported to have epilepsy throughout his childhood. And that guy, while never really specifically talking about Satan, was clearly into altered personalities and symbols and these things. And it's also interesting to note about Gacy that he, he never used the, uh, the rounded uh, makeup with clowns, which gives them, uh, which at least tries, quote unquote, to give them their uh, a more warm presence. He always used jagged angles and it came across very like demonic in many ways. Mm. It's, it's creepy. Um, and you have other, you, you have other serial killers too. And what you find is that when they're diagnosed with epilepsy or have reports of it, they're always um, uh, fascinated with uh, the occult. Um, 
was very interesting. Talk about um, Cenobites or uh, Lovecraftian old ones that uh, that that may uh, creep open. In a uh, uh, John Keel's got a great quote about this about how our fears and gullibility and instincts when not kept in check or well understood in that Buddhist sense, they can lead us astray and lead us to open up these doors in our consciousness um, that that things can slink through to to uh, become parasitic with us. Um, you know, it's the prover it's it's the proverbial vampire where um, the old the the old thing with the rule with the vampire is um, you have to let them in, you know, and then and then once you let them in, the game's over. You're toast. Oh man, well said and very intense. Yes, and it is true. Most serial killers did hear voices in their head, and we assumed they were just crazy, but I highly doubt it. And they all, of course, had really bad childhoods. Even uh, people try to use the exception. Well, Ted Bundy, no, when you look at his childhood, he got messed over as a kid. So uh, mm -hmm. something is going on there. And um, But Vance, any questions or comments? Well, let's see. This goes way back to Nate. Um, Yasmin wants to know, Yasmin Emmerich wants to know, um, where did you find out that the heart's magnetic field has a range of six feet? Do you remember where that was? I've heard that. Um, yeah, I believe you can look at HeartMath Institute for that. But, oh, um, yeah, just, HeartMath, yeah. Right on, right on. Um, I think that's just one of many places. Um, and do your own research. If I'm wrong, update me. Uh, that's always, you know, I could be wrong. With the radio head, I might be wrong. But, you know, thank you for asking. That was a cool question. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, with these things, as far as magnetic fields, any kind of field, it never just stops, right? It just gets weaker and weaker. Mm -hmm. the um, r squared law r cubed law whatever so usually they figure so many db down from the original signal that's they just arbitrarily say that's where the field ends but i have an observation and this is a quick one pertinent to everything we're talking about um another realization i had is uh, a lot of these questions about you know what demons are and are they real and so forth really boil down to whether or not we as individuals or have the capability of contacting other entities other than through the physical world. If we're totally isolated and it's impossible, then you'd have to posit, well, then it's somehow within our own minds. Of course, then you got to ask, well, how deep does the mind go, right? And there, there's this inner versus outer. But if ESP right. exists, right, then, uh, and if we can contact each other, if we can contact other entities at other levels, then a lot of this stuff becomes a lot more understandable. Uh, demonic possession, for example, you know, allowing somebody to, in other words, making a mental contact and having their, you know, like if you're in a conversation with somebody that's got a very strong personality, they kind of can take over the personality and you kind of follow along, you know, that kind of thing, that demonic possession could be thought of like that. So anyway, that's just a thought. And let's see, any other? Oh, somebody, uh, Yasmin Emmerich just came up with the heart, heart math uh, uh, quote that said it can be detected three feet away from the body. Well, okay. Depends on how sensitive your detector is, doesn't it? Probably. <laughs> your magnetometer absolutely. Is, is more sensitive, then you could probably detect it further away. In fact, in theory, every field goes on infinitely until maybe the Plank distance gets in the way or something, and it gets lost in noise. But the donut shaped. Ah, oh, yes, donuts. Oh, now I'm hungry. <laughs> I didn't have dinner yet. Homer. Oh, somebody said my sound is low. Okay, how's this? Is this any better? Yeah, no, my sound a little better. better. Yeah, sorry. I just switched channels. My mute button got worn out. <laughs> I use it too much. Uh, we had yeah. donuts today. We actually, uh, the better half got us a half rack of donuts or whatever it's called. A half a baker's non-dozen, something like that. Uh, uh, it's, it's like a parasitic thing like a McDonald's advertisement or, you know, like product placement. That's a type of, uh, what do you call it? You know, besides the fact that, you know, the CIA turns off the TV when they go into your house, like you're already getting bathed in whatever that is. Like the little insidious, like little demonic magic little m right there the golden yeah. arches for you they're told rays you know <laughs> there you go yeah christopher columbus got crucified on golden arches there you go uh, not yeah. mine those are sage francis lyrics look him up in his 9-11 song makeshift me makeshift patriot 
Good I deal. took the kids trick or treating, so there's plenty of sugar running around this house, and they're like oh. falling asleep. Uh, falling, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a rough couple of days with these kids. A pancreatic but, holiday. Yeah, yeah, it's just. Uh, but <clears throat> that's Halloween now. Did I ever? Sure. About uh, the fake alien abduction, that that's all I want to say is just remember fake alien abduction. If you if you start to see anyone, especially with a TTSA, that's a bunch. That's the real guy. Those are the little oh, boys yeah. in Halloween masks every day of their life. They can't be real. They can't face their shadows. All you know is that like anything you think about being cool as a person, just to be cool is to be kind, to be compassionate, and to be brave. You know, be a good person and never ever let defeat sink in. You know, once we take off the masks. You know, and actually, everyone take off the masks. Anyways, uh, I don't know. Just thought to say that. Awesome. No, no, it's okay. I, uh, I enjoy watching uh, dark journalists and Chris Knoll slam him on the, on Twitter, which is good enough for me. So I get <laughs> my 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 excitement out of that. But uh, going back to Clive Barker, and it does kind of relate because we're talking about egregores, thought forms, how much energy you can give them. Mm-hmm. But really? uh, my probably my favorite Barker movie and uh, I think is probably the most powerful uh, racial movie. One of them, because again, it's so mythological, so symbolical and it is being remade. Uh, It's not remade. They're coming out with a sequel. I think Jordan Peele is producing it, but that is Candyman. And I think it's an incredible film. I mean, from uh, Philip Glass's soundtrack to the, the story, it's about a modern myth. It's about urban blight. Cabrini Green, I have walked through Cabrini Green, and it is, well, it doesn't exist anymore, but it is it was such a mindfuck. And uh, an incredible movie, but the, the quote-unquote, again, in the movie, all the characters are flawed, and you can't really find a hero in the movie, even Candyman. As much as he's a victim, he's become a sort of demon, And he needs the worship of these people in the projects to have his power. Way before Neil Gaiman and American Gods, Barker was playing with this idea. And this Candyman demon has to sort of have a human sacrifice because people are stopping. They're stopping. They don't believe him so much. So he's freaking out because that's how he has immortality, can have vengeance upon the people that, you know, uh, really hurt him back when he was uh, just a, a, an innocent black guy who got uh, racially discriminated and unjustly killed. But uh, have you watched that movie, Anthony? Yeah, I, Candyman, a classic. It's a great movie. Yeah, extremely. And uh, um, I'm glad you brought it up because uh, that I, that really does highlight um, several different ideas that we've uh, we, we've brought up a little bit. Um, and uh, um, you know, on that note, uh, cause I think that this really illustrates, um, a lot of the motifs in, uh, in Clive Barker's work, um, all throughout, um, and, uh, and some of the best that, uh, horror fiction in general has to offer is, um, um, and again, in the spirit of Halloween, I thought it would be worth bringing up, um, Anton LaVey a little bit because, uh, yeah, the guy, um, is a interesting guy and, um, I, in many ways, um, I while I'm not, I certainly don't consider myself a Satanist or even particularly endorse it. Uh, there is value to it, especially when you understand that there's uh, um, this uh, this this atheist quality to it, where it's much more of a rebellion against um, uh, what you would call or, uh, uh, overzealotry and orthodoxy in these things, uh, and uh, honestly, just thinking for yourself in many cases. Um, um, and in many ways, I, uh, I consider Anton LaVey to be like the Andy Kaufman of esotericism. Um, he was always uh, he was always grandstanding and it was always tongue in cheek and he was always lying for a joke. And if and he has quotes where he says, don't trust me, I'm a liar. I lie for fun constantly. Um, and for that reason, I, I enjoy LaVey uh, because he, I, I don't really think you could argue that he wasn't a bit of a, a sociopath at times, but he was just really in it for the laughs and the money. He was not like a cult leader, you know, like I, uh, I would definitely, I put it like this. People kind of sometimes lump uh, Aleister Crowley and LaVey into similar territory. Um, and I think that that's, um, well, you know, the, the, well, I can understand why at a glance, it's a bit unfair uh, contextually. And certainly if you ask me, I would, 
much rather have a beer with Anton LaVey than Aleister Crowley. Um, Crowley was a trust fund brat, if we're being real. Um, so is that why uh, Anton LaVey looks exactly like Ming the Merciless from Flash Gordon? <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. It yes. Really? I, and Max von Sydow played him in the movie. The Flash Gordon. Yeah. We get back to six now degrees to tell, of Max von Sydow. I have to tell my true story. Anton LaVey's music director at one point in time was this guy. Um, I shouldn't mention his name, I suppose, but um, it's been a long time and he's not into it anywhere. But anyway, my first wife ran off with his music director. Wow. And I, yeah. And I heard all the stories and so forth. And uh, these people uh, did not give a crap about anybody they were totally selfish totally mm -hmm. narcissistic whatever was good for them in fact if you leave, read the satanic bible and i've skimmed through it here and there pretty much says that you know whatever you want to yeah. do it's, uh, and uh, a lot of people think that thelema uh, from uh, uh alistair crowley says that but i don't really think it does i'm and crowley was much more and i think uh, much more studied and intelligent and so forth yeah he, he had weird ideas and he was kind of perverted but uh the good stuff coming out of crowley is good but i don't know uh, you know anton lavey was an entertainer in fact i think they were all entertainers but i wouldn't want to hang out with them i wouldn't you don't turn your back on them that's my no. opinion no yeah no. fair enough I, I couldn't disagree with any of that um i think that uh um, while LeVay was uh, full of himself for sure. And I wouldn't exactly consider him a good person. I, um, I think that, uh, that, uh, and ag again, this is all a bit debatable because the historical record is very vast. Um, and, and there's different, um, there's different plot points here, if you will. But, uh, I think that Crowley was a bit more nefarious and heinous in the long run, certainly more perverted. It would, uh, the record would show, but, um, um, yeah, um, I think that um, LeVay, uh, and, and it's very good to bring up the fact that, and this is why I don't endorse Satanism, um, even in the atheistic sense, is because they, there you do find way too much overlap with narcissism, um, unfortunately. But um, it's good because um, um, when people think that, uh, well, when I'm bringing this up, I also like to uh, bring up the fact that um, the core tenet of um, Satanism from a psychological perspective um, is this sort of um, uh, em embrace of the shadow um, in this uh, Clive Barker sort of Cenobite type of sense uh, where even in the Faustian sense where you're learning through the obstacles um, and embracing the uh, the chaos of life and almost embodying that in some way. Um, and even and he, even Jung talks about this because this is part of the individuation process. And in essence, this is um, some of the steps involved with the alchemical process. And this is why I am an, a hermeticist, if anything, because Satanism relishes the left hand and stays at the beginning stages of the alchemical process, if you want to look at it on the grand scale. Um, but it is interesting to note, um, and um, even Jung, you know, it's the whole um, follow your blisters, not your bliss. Um, <laughs> it, you know, I think it's good to follow your bliss sometimes, sure, but the balance, the middle path, that's that's crucial. And um, even Jordan Peterson, whether you disagree or not with his politics, um, um, he said many times um, uh, something reminiscent. I mean, this is a Jungian principle in and of itself that you have to, you have to. Um, um, understand and be able to almost in a Solomonic kind of way control the the evil inside you because we, we all have varying degrees of good and evil and if you go about this follow your bliss avoid all negativity that stuff creeps up on you uh, whether you like to think of it or not because if we're being real um, those uh, those pedophiliac priests are probably much worse than Anton LaVey ever was uh, talk about real Satanism and real evil, you know, so there are certainly varying degrees of these things and we have to be able to identify because in the long run, when we're talking about the scale of dark and light in the alchemical process, um, you have to, like I said, with the Buddhist notion of understanding the, the, the problems, um, um, you have to diagnose your issues. Otherwise, you're never going to know what you're searching for or, or what direction to go with your remedies. 
Um, and that's why identifying the, the, uh, the at least potential for evil inside you is, uh, it's like an exposure therapy. You know, that's a great thing in therapy with people with OCD and other things. You expose them to dirty rooms and make them clean and, uh, and, it, and it desensitizes them. Um, and it's, uh, but it's a, it's a strong, powerful thing. And while we should not, um, um, I think that, um, again, a- among other reasons why I disagree with LaVey, um, I think that it was a misstep to glorify um, the left-hand path and um, and what you would call demonology. But um, to have um, to have some sort of I- I- identifying um, relationship with it is uh, is definitely a really important takeaway. Um, and also, it's important to know that just because something looks good doesn't mean that it's good. Uh, like like a corrupt priest or like I know you uh, I know you're a fan of uh, Homelander. In uh, in the boys, Miguel. Oh. Yeah, great, yes. great show. Too. Yeah, yeah. He's, the, I mean, he's the great archetypal symbol of the demiurge and the narcissist, right. and 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 th- what the actor does in the show. He actually, you know, as much as Homelander is such a, a a murderous fiend, you do have some empathy for him because he was built in a lab. Basically, he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was again like. Linda Blair in The Exorcist. His soul was broken when he was a child and he, we created a monster, which is what our governments, our corporations, our intelligence services do across the world. So Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's, uh, that's why, because, you know, uh, because of the union um, um, sentiments and the deep, uh, the fact that uh, Jordan Peterson steeped himself so much in Jung, um, oh, yeah. I don't agree with all, all of his politics, but there's some that I do agree with. And I really do enjoy Peterson's uh, takes on symbolism and evolutionary mm-hmm. psychology. And oh, he has a very, very valid point about um, – um, that he likes to bring up sometimes about the whole the, the the metaphorical Auschwitz concentration camp waiting to be awakened inside each and every one of us, um, um, and and that it's your personal existential responsibility to make sure that that does not happen and to understand how that could happen if you slip up because we're all human and we can all go down these intense rabbit holes and just snowball downward without even before we even realize what's happening. And the same goes, there's equal and opposite reaction here. That's how, that's how we have these, uh, these divine beatific um, experiences. Um, You know, psychedelics are, um, are a, a perfect articulation of it. You got good and bad trips. Some people are permanently scarred from psychedelics and some people probably more people than than those who are scarred experience tremendous benefit me included um but you know you got to know what you're doing you know a sword has two edges know what you're doing know how to use it yeah or have uh have a psychopomp with you somebody who can guide you a teacher a shaman <laughs> uh, a clinicist somebody who's right there who can don't go too far off the path. Don't go too far here. You know, watch where you're going. I think that's then. Yes, yeah, psychedelics are awesome. Um, good deal, uh, Nate. Uh, you have anything to say or a question, my friend? Oh, jeez. Uh, that's all. That's that was. I don't know. Um, I think that LSD is wonderful if used appropriately, and mm-hmm. I've had. Uh, life-changing experiences a few times involving uh, like Radiohead and like other things oh. you can hear me talk about later where like well, Radiohead I- you don't need the drugs it's just good <laughs> it was Bonnaroo 2006 <laughs> and um, like I literally sang all the words at the same time even the three songs that were coming out later that October in 2007 from In Rainbows so it was wicked trippy and someone else came out after he was like how did you do that I'm like I don't know <laughs> It was That's really, awful. yeah, you get it. I guess like, you can fucking get it. Um, so anyway, like, yeah, tool and mushrooms for me. I've, uh, I've had similar experiences. Yeah. We go, we go, we go and talk after we go, we go and talk. This, Perfect. Uh, tool, tool Tell is maybe a thing actually. Anyways, um, I just saw the Pussifer, <laughs> Pussifer just did a live thing last night where they did a first, um, of its kind, like live concert. And they said, prepare to be abducted. And the whole thing, you can't tell. I don't think it was live maybe some parts but they did a great job at blending the reality so i'd like to shift it i guess my point would be this what's the new demon what's the new deceiver 
is it this is it the thing that's been like playing Halloween for the past like since March? You know, event two oh one everyone. Who's the real demon there? Is there a demon that's trying to make it so you can't have an inside voice, an inside conversation? Like, where's Halloween end? Is it one night or do we actually need to step into the characters that we need to play to bring out what's inside of us so that we project it into the hall of whatever it's a Rupert Sheldrake field so that we own the reality so that every day's Halloween? I don't know. Mic drop. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> agreed. Agreed. We, we got to cosplay, but not to fool ourselves, but to trick the archons. I think that's the game we have to play. Yeah. Uh, as I keep saying, uh, in the Truman Show, he doesn't escape until he starts playing the same dirty tricks that Kristoff plays on him. So he can't beat him being nice. He, you know, to fight the Empire is to be the Empire. So he has to out-weird him, if you would, out-trick him. Um, yeah, that's the battle we're here. And um, another question I had for you, Anthony. Unless uh, does the audience have a uh, does the audience have a question, Vance? Before I, I don't go to see another... one. Don't All right. see one. Yeah, it's a big group, and yeah, they're having a good chat. Awesome. Yeah. This is actually a question from your book. Uh, I was going to say Diver Down again, but uh, <laughs> Dive Manual. Yeah, Pretty Woman. Anybody remember the video from Van Halen for Pretty Woman? That would not survive today. It's the most politically incorrect, dirty, me too against music videos but anyway after this show go watch pretty woman the video with uh, van halen i mean it's just and david lee roth is just talk about there's a case study in insanity right there we could go on time, but, <laughs> but anyway in our last interview this is something that vance brought up and i think he's a hundred percent right but i ask you about heuristic mysticism and we mm -hmm. talked about i think we only talked about it for about two or three minutes and then you know how it is. We kind of went somewhere else. Could you maybe explain that? Because I think that's one of the important parts of your book and actually could be useful as we're trying to get all this, you know, psycho spiritual Jungian stuff going. Yeah, uh, that that point is a good cherry on top to the conversation. Um, and because the reason that um, I don't know, there's a multiplicity of symbols, there's um, recurring archetypes, but different memes that, to express these archetypes. There's so many different names and depictions of different gods, but there's classifications for each of them. And uh, that's because you have to, you have to be incorporate, you have to incorporate uh, is a, a, these heuristic control methods, these evolutionary psychological control methods with which you can begin understanding things uh, similar to like a, a trade, like uh, with the, the old Freemasonic creed of like building your temple of uh, existence, um, uh, physically, mentally, and spiritually brick by brick. These things are, there's a, there's a trade quality to it. There's a skill to it. Um, and um, you have to, uh, it, some people look, uh, take this at a nihilistic perspective, and they see all these different religions and different spiritualities, and think um, at a, at a surface level glance, like it's all just. Um, especially when they're all so convinced that they're right. So many of them, all these different religions uh, squabbling over each other. People think, well, obviously, not, none of it is. Uh, but what if it all is? Um, and there is, uh, there's a trial and error method involved with it. Um, and because, I mean, obviously it's not, it's in some sense, it's as real as you make it to be. And that's why there's so much uh, there of this um, hypnotic mechanism. And we're dealing with trance states and we talk about these trans physical things um, because uh, there is, there is the subjective there uh, and there's the objective. There are things as we, um, as they are. And then there are, um, uh, there's our internal experience, and then there is how we perceive the things on the outside, which is quite different than what is actually on the outside. They are connected. There's this, but but again, talk about sliding scales. How we perceive the outside and what's actually going on on the outside can be very skewed. Obviously, just look at eyewitness testimony. So, um, understanding heuristic and understanding that heuristic being an evolutionary psychological trial and error uh, uh, self-education process um, the, through using symbols. Um, um, when, when you start to understand that um, 
yeah, uh, like obviously a spirituality in, um, in the vast majority of cases, if not all cases, it's not literally true. Um, but there's so much heuristic, um, allegorical, metaphorical value to be had. And that's the entire point is that there's, um, there's a, there's not only a difference between the subjective and the objective, but there's a difference between, um, your unconscious motives and your conscious motives. Um, and understanding heuristics, uh, understanding the self-education process that our brains have become evolutionary developed to use um, is crucial in understanding how you interpret this information. Because we talk about interpreting things like dreams and interpreting um, the unexplainable phenomena that we experience like dreams. And uh, this is this is how you go about it. You go about understanding your own uh, heuristic uh, fingerprint, so to speak, because we're all dealing with the same types of biology and evolutionary pressures, obviously, but um, each person is, um, is very uniquely specific. Um, so it, uh, it's important to realize that while you can take um, heuristic truth from, um, from these things, like nothing, nothing is entirely true. I mean, that's also a very Buddhist notion that as soon as you start to acquiesce some sort of knowledge, you automatically begin to lose some of the trimmings of that, not that concept. So good to keep in mind, I suppose. Uh, um, and that's, uh, and that's why horror is so valuable ultimately, um, that you, you shouldn't, um, you should keep a nice balance, but, um, there's a real philosophy to horror and, understanding the heuristic implications and aspects of horror um, are infinitely valuable, um, much more valuable than um, following your bliss sometimes, not necessarily all the time. Um, but, um, you know, if, uh, if we, if we have extra time here, um, sure. I, I thought it would also be cool to bring up um, cause We've uh, Lovecraft gets so uh, has gotten a lot more attention these days with Lovecraft Country and everything else. Um, so um, um, it's it's good that we brought up Clive Barker again because he's he's certainly one of my favorites as well. Um, I almost uh, see him as like the Philip K. Dick of horror in some ways. Um, yeah, uh, but um, another unsung hero of um, of horror that I believe on the timeline inspired. Uh, Barker and definitely Stephen King um, is uh, good old Richard Matheson, author of I Am Legend and uh, all these other classical stories, as well as What Dreams May Come. Um, oh, wow. He wrote, he wrote. Yeah. Um, and, and he also wrote some Twilight Zone episodes, uh, which is cool. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, Richard Matheson wrote the uh, William Shatner episode where he sees the thing on the airplane wing um, oh, for. Wow. That one that's like the most classic Twilight Zone, uh, right, but I am at 15,000 feet or whatever it is, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah. classic. Um, so, um, uh, but I am legend, G good movies and all because they've made multiple. But the book, uh, if anyone's looking for really good horror that is really esoteric and really philosophical, you got to check out I am legend. Um, uh, because uh, it, it's often lost in the movies that uh, these things aren't exactly zombies. They're very traditional vampires they that torment vampire. Robert Neville. Yeah. The, the protagonist. And um, it's, it's so interesting to note that as, uh, the more Neville tries to understand and adapt to being the only human left amidst these vampires, he gets into this, uh, there's a blurring of the lines between, um, science and superstition and history as he tries to track the nature of this disease throughout history so he can learn um, what, uh, why these things are happening. Like, why is this a disease, yet these things still um, are high, uh, highly affected by things like garlic and supposedly other superstitious elements like crosses. And, um, and it's also so eloquent to note because I Am Legend is one of the most, uh, in my mind, quintessential depictions of um, the, the, like, the multiplicity of the shadow complex in the human experience. Because not only is Neville uh, surrounded uh, on every end by actual vampires, um, you could, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very uh, notable throughout the book that his, perhaps his greatest adversary is literally his own internal uh, shadow complex. 
uh, being completely isolated in a world with vampires, he's afraid of himself more than anything because he doesn't understand himself and he doesn't understand how he can adapt to the situation. Um, so um, I am legend. Great stuff right there. Um, another unsung hero, like I said. Yeah, the good uh, ones never get the credit they deserve or enough never, credit. Yeah, not usually. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, there's so like I said, there's so much value in horror, and it's not to glorify these things. Uh, it's to um, respect them in a way, uh, because um, you you have the you have to um, I don't know you got to respect something's um, power, um, it, you know, um, it, 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 in order to again um, uh, understand it in that Buddhist notion and to take the power back. You have to. To identify these things and um um you know for uh i definitely recommend that any listeners check out dive manual the book um i will be coming out with some more material before too long um stuff that's uh extensions of this material and and you know um i figured that it would be good to um at the end of uh, of this whole discussion here to just uh, articulate that despite all this horror and malevolence and, and all these uh, just terrifying things. Um, there is really transcendent, powerful, divine qualities to existence as well, as I'm sure all you guys know. Um, and it, uh, yeah, that's definitely something that we talk about in the book. Um, you know, it, I'm not like it's. Uh, you don't want to get too wrapped up in um, in in the the more uh, evil qualities of things, but um, um, you gotta, you gotta take the bad with the good. Unfortunately, uh, that's just, that's the nature of existence. Yeah. And that's the, yeah, that's the human heart, the human soul. It's light, every light always casts shadow. So you gotta deal with that shadow and the universe casts a shadow. So awesome. Well, as we get to the end, any final questions, Vance from the audience or yourself? I don't see any questions. I'm looking, looking, looking. Uh, no, I don't see any questions. I hope I didn't miss any. If any, if I missed anybody, please uh, <laughs> type now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, next it, day bite live. well, it just moves so fast. It's da -da 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 people talking. So it's uh, what about you, Nate? Does JJ have a question? Uh, well, before I pass, I'm going to say uh, Vampire by Criterion Collection. Uh, with, I flashed it on the screen earlier. That's an old school 1932. So when you add the one in the, th it's a 33. So watch Vampire by Criterion Collection because it does touch on that kind of, it actually literally used some of the same language um, that was used tonight to describe vampires, like about this kind of like, well, I'll let you watch it. Um, awesome. I think of like 28 Days Later and how the monkeys were shown like our lower monkey because like you could say like there's the mark of the beast system which is only using your first three chakras but like if you are a whole person i don't know something something use your whole thing and do service um but like yo i mean like if you're only using that part of that then you could see how people will forever get locked into try to vampirically sucking off of other people too so mm -hmm. those are what you would call a ticks and a leech and they set up systems to make it so that they can continually do that with less and less effort so the more i mean if it's a vampiric system they're going to set it up so the least they have to so anyways uh oh, it's not even what i was going to say but that's kind of a cool thought um yeah let me pass it to jj no she's oh i mean um <laughs> let me uh say, she says thank you and no um i'll say that my favorite monster in any um i guess uh book or movie or anything that i've ever seen is probably the microwave and infinite jest mm. <laughs> that's 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 or the tv maybe uh well but yeah that's what we'll say for now yeah it's tv cool. yeah tv will destroy our brain that's for sure but even as a after this show i'm gonna watch the mandalorian with my son so that was what he wore today with the baby <laughs> yoda and everything on the shoulder won a contest at his jiu-jitsu so Awesome. Awesome. Well, my takeaway, if anything for the audience, besides thank you so much for being here is uh, go listen to the uh, Candyman original Philip Glass soundtrack. It's very haunting. I used to use that as a background music in the early days of Aeon Bite. 
Uh, it's very good. Go read Imagica if you get a chance. Weave World is excellent. And uh, let's see if we can get some more mysticism and occultism and mythology into the, the horror genre, which will, again, help us all and uh, rejuvenate the much needed, uh, well, all of Hollywood needs salvation. I don't know. If yeah. there is. <laughs> but anyway, yes, for the audience, of course, uh, there'll be the replay after this, and I will put an audio version on all the podcast channels, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes. So if you just want to listen to it, audio as many want to do, I will definitely, you will be able to find it. And uh, so, but yes, we are at the end. Well, Anthony, as always, thank you very much for coming on. Uh, you want to tell the audience where to find more information? Did I miss that? Do you have a website or? Yeah, I got a little bit of action people can look up. Um, you know, you go check out, you go get a dive manual, um, uh, Empirical Investigations of Mysticism. You can find it on Amazon, um, ebook or print. And uh, you can go to divemind.net. Uh, to find, uh, I plan on uh, putting some more material up on there, but at the moment, if nothing else, it's a, uh, it's a good place to find um, all the links with, uh, with quick write-ups to all the interviews I've done. Uh, so you can find more material, supplementary material to the book and stuff like that there. Uh, you could also, if you want to start a dialogue or anything, you can find me on Twitter, uh, lowercase um, at uh, dive mind six, six, seven. So um yeah, I'm always happy to hear from anybody. Uh, I hope everybody has a good Halloween and uh, learned something about this and uh, isn't going to have any trouble going to sleep tonight because uh, <laughs> there are equal and opposite reactions. There's just as much and uh, just as powerful um, a divinity out there. Uh, yes. So yes. great things in mind. Um, we're, we're, we're blessed to be breathing. So. Amen. Amen. Yes, there is a rescue operation and good will triumph in the end. So <laughs> Amen. Awesome. And uh, yeah, audience, uh, yeah, definitely get Dive Man. It's a good, it's a great book, and a lot of what we talked about tonight, Crowley, mythology, Jung, everything is in that book, and he puts a, uh, it's, it's a good read, and um, highly Thank recommend you. it. And definitely check our last interview, which we did, I think, uh, in spring. And, uh, mm -hmm. Was it spring? Was it pre-corona or? after corona it seems like it was uh, right after. it was was it okay yeah. i don't think we even talked about it damn it i mentioned it tonight one show <laughs> without mentioning that bloody virus damn it <laughs> oh well one day uh well and then vance thanks for uh keeping us company on this exorcism oh it's a lot of fun a lot of good info anthony uh, doing a great job occult fan oh, all right he's got a scooby bone there looks like somebody burned one end of it oh <laughs> oh it's a pipe <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, yeah okay 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 yeah we don't want the it. algorithms to find us so yeah <laughs> yeah thanks Nate, so good much hanging out with you and miguel always uh glad to appear with you here and awesome. happy halloween and okay everybody on the chat room all right yeah. audience thank you thanks very much here. thanks for being here and thanks for being yourself thanks for being here nate and 